Hello everyone. This lecture we will talk about uh, the power system. Originally, I was designed um, to talk more about life cycle assessment and the environmental impact of the energy system. We already covered the environmental impact of the energy system and the life cycle assessment is rather standard methods and practice. And there are tools and the database that you can use. So if you are interested, please do some background research and it's comparatively straightforward to follow the instructions or manual by those database uh, tool, for example, open LCA, uh, database can be uh, international or domestic. There are uh, database available, uh, mostly related to the em uh, emission factors of uh, specific products or process. Uh, by saying that, uh, so if you're interested in the life cycle assessment of uh, the energy systems, there are quite a lot of resources that online you can uh, follow. So we want to have a deep dive in LCA. Uh, rather, we hope to uh, introduce more in the power sector uh, because uh, as I mentioned uh, early, uh, power sector uh, is very important uh, when we think about the energy system. Some uh, as here are some sample analytic questions uh, using the power system analysis, uh, such as how much solar wind capacity need to be built to achieve net zero carbon emission power sector, um, how cost decline of the renewables, especially solar wind and storage, we have changed the capacity and the generation mix of the power sector. That has to do with the key assumptions. For example, the costs of uh, specific technologies. This can be um, solar wind, can also include offshore wind, storage, and other emerging technologies. How much new transmission capacities is needed to harvest the benefits of intercollections, uh, especially when we talk about uh, larger uh, intercollections between cross regions and those high voltage or ultra high voltage transmission lines can uh, make a huge differences. And uh, other questions such as carbon capture sequestration does CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage or sequestration has a role to play in the power sector decarbonization. It depends many different assumptions, uh, technology, maturity, uh, commercialization, costs and comparative costs with renewables and other technologies. Um, so, those are some uh, sample questions that with this lecture, you may be able to explore there are far more than those questions, but uh, as zero, this offers some um, inspiration for you to think about. Power sector is uh, very important uh, and uh, it has a central role in achieving decarbonization. So the overarching strategy in our decarbonization discussion is we try to electrify our energy system, energy consumption or energy demand, uh, electrify as much as possible, uh, our cooling, heating, cooking, all different kinds or transportation, all different kinds of uh, energy needs we we'll try to electricity as much as possible uh, for different reasons, right? Electricity is high quality, uh, very convenient to use and easy to use. And um, 
uh, it can be anytime, anywhere uh, with uh, access to electricity. Also because the generation of electricity, we can talk about decarbonization. Um, this can be uh, generated from um, low carbon sources, uh, nuclear, geothermal, renewables. It can be centralized or distributed if it's from conventional uh, technologies, for solar, uh, sorry, uh, coal, natural gas, oil, fuel uh, plants, uh, with the introduction of uh, or, or applications of a carbon capture and sequestration, still you can uh, get um, zero emissions. Uh, so with electrification and the decarbonization, uh, make it tangible to achieve um, net zero carbon emissions. Uh, that's why uh, power sector uh, in order to produce transmit and um, make sure this reliability safety of the electricity services are quite central in this discussion and that's exactly why we designate one lecture uh, to talk more about it um, so why power sector is special uh, for many different reasons uh, first Electricity is such an essential good for our daily life. Um, it provides the fundamental service that is key to access other services such as uh, education, public health, um, no need to say heat and cooling, uh, and uh, those are basic needs and the access to clean energy, clean water, and even clean air. So uh, electricity is fundamental. Uh, and to our digital life, right? Uh, without electricity, you do not have service to internet. And without internet, it's, uh, you will be panic. Um, and second, the service, especially the reliable uh, service of electricity rely on huge infrastructure. This includes um, generators, uh, transmission lines, uh, and uh, all the transformers, reliability, digital management, all the uh, devices, um, appliances that use electricity and it rely it has a huge infrastructure need uh, in order to provide a service and uh, we can compare it with uh, the IT revolution or the uh, or software the modular cost of a distributor one extra copy of software is zero, right? You, once your soft, software is ready, it's just uh, some lines of a code and you can distribute it with one extra copy with, with no zero uh, marginal cost. But that's not the case for electricity. Um, one extra, extra kilowatt of electricity, you still need the infrastructure uh, to, to, to deliver that service or you need, still need the, the investment or the operation and management and um, renewables might be a little bit different um, because the marginal cost of uh, one extra generation once the investment there is low but uh, it's still different than the uh, software uh, case. And for electricity, they are also involve technology and the network complexity that supply and demand has to match um, in 
real-time basis. Uh, that's um, very, very, very hard to achieve. Uh, it involves technology regulation markets uh, to make it work. And there are also some economic reasons like supply demand in elasticity. Uh, from supply side, if you want to have one extra generation, you need investment, invest uh, new capacity, for example. Uh, no matter it's a uh, coal, gas, or nuclear power plants, or it's a uh, rooftop solo, commercial solar, utility scale solo, you need that extra investment. And the investment can take time. A solo PV utility scale might one or two years. Nuclear, it can be six to seven years or even longer, depends uh, the permitting or the construction. Um, so if you want a new um, power plant, for example, uh, if, if you wish in short of uh, electricity this summer or this winter, um, it, it cannot, uh, immediately match that gap you we would need an investment and that the investment take time um, so those characteristics of the power sector really define how we can analyze it uh, here's the example of the u.s electricity flow uh, we can see there are multiple features uh, where our electricity come from uh, fossil steel has larger but increasingly replaced by uh, lower carbon sources such as nuclear renewable, uh, especially renewables. And 2019 uh, marked as a, a tipping point that we got, um, U.S. got more electricity from renewables than from coal. So that we will talk more in the energy transition, uh, but that's uh, the power sector really experiencing some uh, fundamental changes. And another key message is here is um, the energy loss during the electricity conversion, about 60 to 70% of the energy is lost during um, the conversion. Uh, so that's an, a uh, huge area to harvest. Uh, any increase of the in efficiency, we have a huge gain. And uh, there are also some other uh, segments like uh, there are the plants where you use some of the electricity for uh, operation, for cooling, for circulation. And uh, that's the plant use. And there it's also transmission and distribution losses. That's usually about four to five percent. Some uh, high voltage transmission lines can be more efficient and less than that. On average, about the scale. And then it's provided to end use in the residential, commercial, and industrial sector. Transport are in increasing uh, electricity consumption for the electric vehicles and that will have uh, impact of how our energy the, the electricity flow basically um, ev really change how uh, the magnitude of the support uh, the demand and also the distribution of the demand charge charge and the discharge I mentioned infrastructure uh, is really a heavy infrastructure in the power sector. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, US transmission grid at a different uh, voltage grade and the interconnections across different regions. And it's really like the road infrastructure and, uh, and it's more complicated because uh, this 
network of transmission has to be um, maintained to keep its reliability, safety, and uh, in today's and the cyber security in order to make this system work. No need to say all the power plants um, cross different uh, regions and different technologies, different features, and increasingly uh, renewables that are less dispatchable. Um, so these massive infrastructure systems provide the characteristics that need to be considered in the uh, analysis. Uh, let's refresh some of the basics we talk uh, in other lectures, uh, such as technology, uh, economics, and we talk about uh, energy and the power, right? Uh, in your analysis, uh, we also emphasize it's very important to use those terms appropriately. Um, energy has a temporal feature in it. Uh, usually, the um, units can be drawer, uh, quartz, megawatt hour, kilowatt hour, uh, power. Um, usually, the units can be kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt, terawatt, and try to get familiar with um, some of the uh, numbers or scale of those numbers. For example, global power uh, is at the scale of 20 terawatt. Um, that's roughly the scale, right? And the household, uh, the power may be 10 kilowatt scale and try to dif differentiate that how much energy a household uh, consume, a typical household in, uh, consumes about 10,000 kilowatt hour of electricity in a year. Um, heat rate and efficiency, we talk about um, heat rate, um, it can be uh, joule per kilowatt hour, how, how, mu uh, how much energy you consume to produce one kilowatt hour of electricity. And efficiency, we talk about color efficiency, first law efficiency, and second law efficiency. Color efficiency is the maximum theoretical efficiency you can achieve. Uh, first efficiency is the direct efficiency. Uh, and second is how much you are first efficient compared to the maximum efficiency. That describes how efficient, uh, how, how good is your uh, machine. Uh, we also talk about some uh, dynamics, different uh, engines, different cycles, and why it's important how to improve the efficiency by the combined cycle. Those are, uh, we already covered in the technology uh, discussion. Um, the power sector, uh, we also need to understand the load factor and the load curves. Um, first is the different difference between the load profile curve and the load duration curve. Um, the left side is a load profile curve in a week. Uh, it's very understandable that you have higher uh, consumption uh, in during the weekdays and lower um, consumption during the weekends. So that's one thing you even uh, in within one day, you usually have a peak during uh, noon time and um, late afternoon time when people uh, in work or when people back home for cooking. And so, there are three categories of load. Uh, the load profile curve, we have peak load. Uh, that load only uh, happened during uh, the peak hours uh, in a day. 
And then you have the intermediate and the base load, uh, which means that it's served 24 hours a day. Um, so, and compared to the total available capacity that because I mentioned supply and demand has to match um, for a real time basis. And which means that the system has to be ready for the peak load. And the total available capacity compared to the peak load, uh, you get a reserve margin. And a reserve margin is usually has to be 10 to 15% in order to provide reliable service because some power plant might need maintenance, some power plant would have technical failure. So in those cases, you would need an extra capacity that can be immediately put onto service. So that's created a reserve margin. And the load profile curve tell us how, where and how big is peak load and how shaky is the peak on the alpha peak. And it tells us the need for base load and different load type are very often made by different technologies. For example, base load very often made by nuclear, coal, and peak loads uh, need a very quick response, very often made by uh, uh, gas plants or storage. And um, renewables are uh, uh, in between uh, to incorporate. Um, so there is a load factor to describe the characteristics, uh, how picky. It's the low shape. It's energy consumed compared to energy and the peak demand. Uh, that means you have average power compared peak power demand. That's the higher the no factor means it's more flat of load profile curve. And it's usually a good thing because um, the peak the load profile, the harder to the operator for the planners because we need uh, more capacity to meet the P. And if some capacity only run a few hours, then it's usually not economic. So you, we would create uh, economic incentives for those capacities to put in service. So that. Uh, uh, let's discuss the no du duration curve. If we rank uh, the plants, let's say how, how, how large the capacity, how large is our power consumed um, from largest to smallest. And then we would get a node duration curve which means uh, how big percentage of our alerts is within what uh, level of alert. So high alert with the peak hours on the uh, very left side, those are the few hours that we have very high uh, power consumption maybe just a few hours during extreme hot days or extreme cold days and other are more flattening out. Uh, so the node duration curve described um, the distribution of our load over a year's time. And that provide a a very useful information for us to think about uh, the distribution of the nodes. And we also have us to prepare um, 
uh, the operation of the system. So both are uh, very common, both are very useful. I uh, hope you will get familiar with uh, those characteristics. And supply has to match demand on real time basis. And that creates the supply curve and the dispatch. If uh, let's say how the power system work, each power plant, they would offer what price they are willing to generate. And the system operator would rank the power plants by their what price they offer from lowest to highest. And the market the cleaning price is the price where the supply meets the demand. Demand can change. I mentioned the peak of peak, right? So in this case, demand, uh, lowest demand within a day and highest demand within a, uh, within a day and that can move. So the cross line is the market clean, cleaning price. That's what the uh, uh, wholesale, the wholesale price is, as market cleaning price. Uh, the design of the market can be very different. Some market is, it's a, uh, market oriented price, which is we got from here, everybody received a uh, marketed clean price, uh, no matter what, uh, where you are, uh, that's a uh, bidding strategy. We, we won't talk more on that, but uh, different companies, uh, you can offer a uh, bid and for some large generators, it's possible that they can manipulate their bid so they can receive higher price. Uh, that's what's happened uh, in, in California's case. And for renewables, because the marginal price is basically zero. So you can you would see their ranking uh, at the lower side, but still they receive the market price. Uh, I know. Um, so this moving towards uh, the upper end, uh, because the supply curve, once it reaches its uh, capacity limit, uh, it's very steep. Uh, so, because some power plants, they only run a few hours to have, to for them to generate one extra kilowatt hour of electricity, the cost is very high. If they, demand continue and it exceeds the physical limit of the capacity, then no matter how high price you are willing to pay, it's just not there. Uh, that's what happened during the um, Texas uh, electricity crisis because some plants are not available. Even you pay one thousand dollar per megawatt hour, you still cannot buy the electricity because it's off the limit. So that's also the unique part of the power system is once you reach uh, the physical limit, the price can be very volatile and uh, the price tag can be extremely high. And uh, because uh, electricity is so essential. Uh, in some scenario, it may just save life, right? So the willingness to pay can be very high, but it's so it's, it's, uh, essential that in order to um, be uh, energy just or or or, or, uh, or equity, as you can uh, see, then it created incentive for uh, price control. That's where uh, the introduction of a uh, um, price cap or other regulations jump in. But uh, as I mentioned, if you introduce price cap, it would have create energy 
uh, or the e economic incentive loss because uh, those plants only run a few hours, they may not have the incentive to, to get it built. Um, the economics of the power sector are a really fascinating area. And if you are interested, I definitely encourage you to read more. And here is just a very brief introduction about how uh, the dispatch work and why it's so important to plan ahead for the system because once you reach the limit, uh, the price can have a huge impact on how much people will have to pay for their electricity. Um, power system modeling, uh, in general, there are three large category of uh, tours. Uh, first is the production cost tour uh, that uh, very technical uh, to Sometimes it's called a unit commitment and dispatch, as mentioned, to uh, dispatch each power plant on real time basis, on and off decisions for each power plant. And ladder work reliability, uh, that's even more technical to have a, a AC power flow a dynamic on uh, uh, even higher resolution seconds, uh, even sub seconds. And capacity expansion model, uh, you really look at uh, long term, uh, can be 10, short, five to 10, or even longer term decades. Uh, investment decisions for the power sector. Uh, for this class, we talk more on the capacity expansion uh, analysis uh, because uh, that's more on the planning side. And for all the models, they would need touch uh, generator assets, transmission, uh, flexibility, and contingencies, uh, frequency, and reliability. Um, in general, more technical, especially the uh, ladder work reliability has to include all those technical features. But capacity exp expansion model very often focus more on the generation and um, transmission with less on the more sophisticated technical details such as contingency, adequacy, and reliability. And very often it simplified the transmission um, to more pipe or transport model than AC uh, power flow model. Uh, I listed some of the examples like uh, Plexus grid view in the unit commitment model and uh, network uh, reliability analysis and that PSLF and power system simulator and for the capacity expansion models, I hope you can pay more attention. There are a few examples like uh, read, reads model given by uh, National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory uh, switch model, which I uh, am more familiar with given at the University of California and the University of Hawaii now, uh, Environment Defense Fund, read pass, Gen Z X. Uh, Python uh, version of a power system analysis and other uh, tools. Uh, you can do uh, some background research on each of those tools, what functions they have, uh, more or less very similar, uh, rely on different packages or software using different uh, coding language, but they function as some similar uh, analysis. Um, in general, uh, the community hope to use more open source tools to create um, the uh, need uh, for more open data, open model, and uh, open software, open results, so we can compare different um, analysis. Um, 
capacity expansion models, as I mentioned, uh, is a um, main focus of our discussion. Usually, those models simulate generation and transmission capacity investments, given assumptions about uh, future electricity demand, fuel prices, uh, investment costs, and uh, efficiency assumptions, and uh, policy and regulations such as uh, carbon emission uh, regulation or uh, emission uh, pollutants uh, emission regulations. And it will, uh, the outcome or the results can be the, the mix, uh, uh, capacity mix or generation mix of a future power systems and the, uh, how different policy affects the cost of the and or the uh, emission trajectory of um, the different power systems. So capacity expansion method is supposed to uh, answer questions of uh, uh, how the system pathway, the power system technology pathway, and uh, what are the costs uh, or impacts of such pathways. It has strengths and limits. Uh, it examines the impacts of power sector policies or technology policies or fuel policies um, and simulates the generational capacity mix in middle and long term. The limits, um, usually it doesn't include some of the technical details to operate the power system um, and uh, so for operation, uh, you would need a more technical analysis such as the uh, production cost and uh, network reliability. It can answer some policy or technical questions, uh, but uh, at the same time be aware of its limitations. Um, here is a comparison of different models. Um, and uh, I hope you can uh, get a sense of uh, what's the merits and limitations of different models. And the goal is to try to cover as much as the functionality at the same time using more open code, open data, open uh, software because the power system is here at a large scale. So it's very often involved high computation resources for optimization purposes. And the optimizer and uh, sometimes or the, the com computation uh, software can uh, very expensive. So, uh, but increasingly there are some alternatives and each alternative has its own um, limitations. Uh, so using this comparison can help us to know uh, really think about what do you need to answer? What questions do you need to answer? And what tools that you want to use? And this provide a, a, a good comparison of this different tools. I'll use switch model as example. Switch is an uh, abbreviation of a solar wind and hydro conventional technologies investment. Um, model. Uh, and as you can see here, it includes uh, generators, transmissions, different energy sources, uh, balancing need, uh, operation need, and um, different time scale, uh, financial considerations. It has coal packages and also has extensions that you can add new technologies, new policies as alternative modules to build on those co core analysis. Um, so it has uh, generation, transmission, distribution, and it can run at balance area, geographic scale, and hourly, even sub hourly time scale. Um, so 
uh, it's open source built on Python. Uh, original was on uh, AMPL and it use, uh, can be used some open source uh, optimizer solver to solve the optimization problems. Key questions when you think about building a power system uh, capacity expansion model. Uh, think about your spatial scale. Uh, the more you, the more details you have, the more technology data and computation burden that you have. And uh, ten per scale, if you run an hourly or uh, daily or seasonally, uh, those are involve different uh, data and uh, computation needs. Um, time steps, if you run hourly, uh, every hour in the year, uh, that's also very intense. Uh, sometimes you would pick up uh, sampling hours or a specific uh, segment of time or using representative hours in the season uh, to represent. Also think about time horizon. Uh, near term, medium term, longer term, uh, and uh, you would run every five year or every ten year. You would have different uh, result, uh, different need for uh, temporal segments, generating units, individual plants, or more plants, or by technology or. Uh, and you, each technology has its technology characteristics um, and representation of the costs and uh, other technical or economic features. Um, transmission distribution and representation of the renewables, what technology you include solar wind and in solar you can have different type of solar uh, wind can include offshore wind um, each technology would need a set of uh, uh, technology and economic uh, data assumptions and for power systems you would need to link with economic wide models so um, you can come up with and the assumption of the electricity demand and node, uh, for example, if we link that to transport model, uh, transportation sector. Uh, if you can also link to uh, the environmental, uh, air pollution or human health analysis uh, models uh, and water consumption uh, analysis models. Um, those are the emerging uh, or the climate uh, uh, model, simulation models, as we talked about last time, the linkages between uh, the energy system and the climate models. Um, typical output, this is an example of the um, output, as you can see uh, here, it shows the dispatch of different technologies, the uh, generation or power from different technologies and um, the electric response, uh, uh, the uh, charge from um, uh, storage and uh, base node very often uh, coal, nuclear, and then uh, add Solo, those from solar and the wind and uh, storage charge. Uh, so, or, or, or discharge. Uh, so this create um, um, first impression of how the system really work with high penetration for renewables and their variabilities of a different amongst this and the need for storage, for example, in order to make the system work. Those are some insights that we can get from those um, uh, analysis and the capacity and the generation mix um, we are 
well, under the dispatch and the cost uh, and emission trajectory are typical uh, output of such models. Other uh, type of, uh, very important output, uh, such as the transmission ex uh, expansion or the energy uh, transmitted. Um, this is a, a typical output of a capacity expansion model, for example, this analysis of a European, as you can see here, uh, the generation uh, mix uh, from a different location and the energy flowing around in the transmission lines. This will show us where the transmission will have um, uh, is constrained and where you need a new transmission in order to move energy around or electricity around. Um, a unit commitment and the network reliability would involve more technical or even higher resolution analysis, uh, usually with more uh, technical considerations. Uh, it's very important if we simulate the operation of this uh, grid. Uh, we would need those models to, uh, in order to keep the system uh, reliable. But uh, for our purpose, we mostly focus on the capacity expansion models. Uh, there are for sure some uh, emergent uh, trends, for example, uh, the digital revolution and the penetration of the smart devices, and that makes uh, the discussion on smart grid, and especially together with the trends to have more renewables, more distributed generation, and the smart grid really present uh, um, emerging trends that can help us to manage the future uh, grid need. Uh, just think about in the future with digital devices, with the smart technologies, um, with uh, renewables, uh, you may be able to sell electricity to your labors uh, on your phone and get paid for the solar generations if you have extra electricity, right? Um, that's just one example or a car, an electric car passing back and charge and pay you uh, and you're charging uh, plug in. Um, so, which means that you can go anywhere to charge your electric vehicles and uh, keep driving, for example. Uh, so, uh, use, uh, uh, use your imagination um, that how the future energy system or future grid can serve the purpose for the energy need we. Uh, the at any time and any place. Um, and renewable are increasingly developing very fast and uh, uh, high penetration. Uh, the higher the renewable penetrate, uh, the more challenge that the grid presents to integrate the renewables because the variability uh, it introduced. Uh, there are still huge uh, potential for efficiency improvement, uh, both in the supply and the demand side, uh, supply efficiency of the generators, demand side efficiency of all the appliances, devices. Uh, electrifying still uh, going and from today's 20 or even less percentage, to maybe 80 or even higher percentage of uh, electrifications. Uh, demand response or demand side management that with regulation or market tours, um, it can reduce the need for peak demand. Uh, now it's already happening, right? With uh, less uh, smart uh, thermostat it can manage your temperature in order to coordinate different houses that 
it can reduce the peak demand at the same time to keep every house uh, comfortable. Uh, those are emergent trends that enabled by technology markets and behavior changes. So to summarize, um, power sector or power sector analysis, can, uh, it's really central in our discussion of dec uh, decarbonization because the overarching strategy is to electrify our energy use and decarbonize our uh, electricity. Um, so in the future, we would in envision people use more uh, electricity as their energy, uh, less and less uh, gas and other gasoline or and other energy source. That makes the decarbonization more uh, tangible. Uh, capacity expansion model uh, is a very useful tool to analyze and optimize the investment decisions because the electricity sector is uh, investment heavy. It has infrastructures. And any decision we make today will have a lock-in effect because it will stuck there for decades. You build a nuclear power plant, it will be there for 60 years, right? Uh, for example. So any investment decisions is very important. That's why uh, those models can help us to analyze, simulate the potential impacts and can offer insights of how the system work. However, decisions in the real world is much more complicated. It has interest groups that have you know, sure of the uh, conventional technologies. It has all the technical details. It involves human behavior. It's very hard to change, to make. And it's, um, uh, the information is not free and all the compl complexities. And that's why we need to pay attention to those emerging technologies, emerging trends, so we can incorporate those uh, trends in our analysis uh, to make uh, the uh, analysis more policy relevant or more adapted to the real world uh, changes. So, I posted uh, some relevant readings and uh, reports on um, my courses. Uh, so uh, please prepare reading those and think more that maybe you can also try out uh, those models with a switch model or the Python power system analysis model. Uh, it will give you a good sense of how those models work. Start from uh, easy ones, it usually provide uh, sample models, start from there, and then you can use your own data to try some more complicated analysis. Uh, that's all for uh, this week. Uh, thank you.